you have your Bibles, turn with me to the New Testament, to Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. And as you're turning over there, I want to give you just a little bit of context with this story. Because in Matthew chapter 19, we have the story of the rich young ruler, or the rich young man, as it's described. And it's the story of the guy that, that comes to Jesus. And he's asking him, what good thing do I have to do in order to be saved? Well, instead of giving him a thing, he ends up giving him a who. He says, there's only one who is good. So when pressed, you know, he says, well, no, Jesus, you've you got to give me something. He says, fine. I want you to go into the marketplace, sell all your possessions and give them to the poor. And we, we know how it turns out. It proved that it was just too much because he was a very wealthy young man. But it concludes this section. And Matthew writes Jesus' words, many who are first will be last, and many who are last are going to be first. And what Jesus is describing and, and what Matthew is telling us about is the kingdom of God doesn't make sense by the world's standards. It's upside down. Things are reversed. Things that uh, people that are valued in society, like this rich young man, somehow can't find their way into kingdom because they're not willing to let go of their own kingdom. And then you have these poor fishermen that are exalted within it because of their sacrifice and their willingness to leave all. And so this is the kingdom. This is an upside-down world that Matthew is describing. And then we've got this parable that's only found within the Gospel of Matthew, starting in Matthew uh, chapter 20 and verse 1 and 2. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. Okay, well, it, at Jewish villages, this is pretty common around harvest time. Uh, grapes, as they come ripe, uh, it, it happens within a very short window. So when they come ripe and they're ready to be cut off the vine, you need to do it before they fall off the vine. Uh, we would go pick grapes out in East Texas to make jam when I was uh, a young boy. And there's just a, a short window in there. Uh, because if you get there a little bit too late, you just start touching them and they start falling off. And so th this was a, a common story uh, that you would have these day laborers that make themselves available from when the crop came in to be hired out by the owners of the vineyard. So in, in one way, it's going to be very familiar to them. But in Jesus' telling... It's also going to be very astonishing because there's some twists and turns that they're not expecting. Well, the workers' hours are right. They generally would work from dawn to dusk. So from 6 a.m. in the morning when the sun comes up until about 6 p.m. as it's starting to go down. And we also had the pay was right. A denarius was known as a living wage. It's what the soldiers got each day to live on. And so it was actually very generous to have these migrant workers, a, a day laborer, that could come in and, and get a full denarius. So it, this is very generous. And also the timing was right. You know, per Leviticus 19 and verse 13, the, the landowner would pay them at the end of the day. So you don't have workers that are going home hungry. They, they had money to go purchase food at the end of the day. So all these things are, are happening. So they're like, okay, th this resonates with me. Well, but before we read on, I want you to look at something that I thought was pretty intriguing. Middle Eastern historian Kenneth Bailey points out that Jesus employs a thousand-year-old uh, seven-stanza template where the first three, you're going to see, are, are also going to relate to the last three in kind of an inverted order. So all this is going to do is going to point us to the very crux of the story, which is right there in the middle at number four. So we'll see what that is in just a few minutes. Right there at the center. But what we have so far here in this story is an agreement has been made between the landowner and these laborers that you'll come work in my vineyard for a denarius. Everyone's happy, everything's great. So he sends them out. Let's continue reading in verse 3. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. So now this is starting to pique the, the interest of those that are listening to this parable because this doesn't make sense. 
Why would he keep coming back? And certainly the vineyard owner could figure out how many workers it would take to, to cover the vineyard and to bring in the crop. So I, I don't think it's the needs of the vineyard that he somehow miscalculated and, and, and tried to short things up by just getting the bare minimum. Then he figures out, well, we're not going to be able to get it in. Let's go get more. I don't think that's it. Well, if that's not it, what's the motivation for him returning to the marketplace? I would say this compassion for the laborers. As he's there, he sees a lot of eager young men that are unemployed at, at the beginning of the day, and they're, they're hopeful. They're, they're standing there. They're, they're ready to go. And for their sakes, he's hoping that there's enough work for all these people because it's a very large crowd. So as he returns home and gets people settled, he starts thinking about those that still remain there in the marketplace. And so their, their faces become right there in his mind. So around 9 o'clock in the morning, he decides to journey back from the vineyard and go back to the market. And he finds other unclaimed workers. I know it kind of sounds like unclaimed baggage, but they, these are the guys who are just standing around. They're, they're not sitting. They're, they're not lazy. They're ready to go. Just, just please give me an opportunity. So he sees these guys. They're ready to work, and so he hires a few more. But this time, when the master takes on these laborers, he doesn't give them a quote for the pay. What he tells them is, you've got to trust me. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to do by you what is right. And so the, the second thing that we see in this text is justice has been promised. I'm, I'm going to take care of you. I'm not telling you what it is, but you need to trust me. And so at, at noon, he returns again. And, and, and this time, he, he's hoping that more would have found work or, or gone home, but he still sees this big crowd. And so again, he takes on a few more. And he puts them to work. Three o'clock. His conscience is still bothering him. So 3 o'clock, he says, I'm going to hop back on the horse and go back into town. So he goes back into the marketplace, ho hoping he's going to see it's vacant. But still, there's the same amount of workers. And so he goes and he hires some more. But each time he tells him, you've got to trust me. I'm going to be just. Let's see what happens in verse 6 and 7. About the 11th hour. This is 5 o'clock. Uh, folks are, are starting to gather tools and, and carrying in uh, baskets from the far part of the vineyard and are wrapping up their day's events. He's back in the marketplace at 5 o'clock. He went and found still others standing around. And he asked him, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Well, no one's hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go work in my vineyard. So you got an hour before sundown, and the master returns to the market for a fifth time. And so for those that are hearing this parable, folks are kind of scratching their heads going, okay, this makes no sense according to business. So what's the point of this? And so he, he's got their attention here. Well, these folks are staying there because hope beyond hope, they're hoping they would have, would have been hired, but they haven't been. But they stay for another reason. Well, what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to return home, and you've got this nervous wife and, and the hungry children, and, and you're like, I, I hate to tell you, but Daddy didn't get hired. Hopefully tomorrow. And then maybe he doesn't want to face his wife. Then what are you doing here? Get, get back out there. Try, try to find something. So they remain, hoping beyond hope that they're going to be hired. And finally, the master returns. So you have those that are sent into the vineyard at the 11th hour. So we've got here the 11th hour workers. So agreement has been made, and, and justice has been promised. And then you add in these 11th hour workers. Now, and at this point, the only people that know what they're going to be paid, the only ones that have struck an agreement are the original workers that have been invited. In, they're under a, a contract for a, for, to work for a denarius. In Matthew 20 and verse 8. Here's the real crux of it. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call all the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, and go to the first. So at the peak of the parable, we have here the payment of the wage. That's what's crucial. That's what stands here in the center. Well, for, for, no, for those that know how this parable turns out, uh, as I'm sitting here kind of studying this week, I was like, I wonder what it would be like if we actually did that today. 
And you know me, I, I don't just wander. I, okay, I'm going to do this. And so I hired some young men to come work at my house yesterday. You guys come on up. We've got Colton, we've got Reuben, and we've got Thomas. And Thomas, I'm going to hand you the microphone. I'm going to let you talk first. Uh, now, Thomas, what are some things that you did over at Jill and I's house to kind of help us uh, around? Uh, I spent the day, or however long I was there, uh, planting mums in your front yard and sanding the uh, logos off the wood off your uh, brand new deck. <laughs> okay, so you're helping doing some sanding and, and getting ready, and so you came around 12 o'clock and you left at 1, is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, because you, you had to come a little bit later because you were working helping uh, Mr. Peep with puppets and everything, so I'm going to go ahead and pay you $40 for that hour. Let's show our appreciation to Thomas for his hard work. Good job. Thank you. Are you happy with that? Uh, I'm very happy. Okay. Well, why don't you pass the microphone on to Reuben, and you can go grab a seat. Reuben, come on over here. Uh, Reuben, you also helped with flowers and, and some of the planting. Uh, what, what else did you help us with um, around the house? Um, well, I helped with the weeding. Help plant plants. Okay, uh, Miss Jill, this is her garden. Uh, last year we spent a thousand dollars and got four tomatoes out of it. Uh, but the garden is kind of overgrown, and, and in parts it's waist high. In fact, there's some weeds that are up to your shoulder. And so, uh, Reuben, you had the unpleasant task of going in and, and clearing some of this out, and it was not a whole lot of fun because there were a lot of briars and everything else. Okay, now, when did you come over? Do you remember? Uh, it, was, it was around 11.50, I think. Yeah, about 11, 11 15, okay. And so you also worked till once. So that's two hours. It, is $40 okay? Yes, sir. Okay, so that's $20 an hour. That's not bad. Let, let's show our appreciation to Ruben. Good job. <laughs> Colton, um, you also helped with flowers. Uh, and nice job on the cactus there. And uh, you also helped with uh, some of the weeding and spreading of the pine needles and stuff. Great job. Um, you also worked for me. Uh, are you okay with how? how <clears throat> well, uh, considering how I know the story ends, uh, I worked from 9 to 12. I think it's actually 9 to 1. 9 but. to 1, yes. My bad. I'm sorry. So, um, you know, I, I mowed grass, and I pressure washed, and I washed your dogs. <laughs> all okay. before they ever came here. And, uh, you know, it's pretty hard work for a while. Okay. But you and I talked, and I asked kind of what the going rate is, because I'm a babysitter, you don't know exactly what it was, and... We came to an agreement of $10 an hour. Is that correct? I mean, that's what we agreed on. Okay, so 9 to 1, that's 4 hours, so there's 40 bucks. But you're not okay with that. I mean, I still worked probably 2 hours longer than Ruben and 3 hours longer than Thomas, so... Okay, but we had an agreement here. Hey, let's, let's give our appreciation to Colton. Great job! <laughs> You see how kind of the rub happens? Uh, did I do anything wrong by Colton? Well, let's talk a little bit. Matthew 20 and verse 9, the workers who were hired about the 11th hour came and each received a denarius. Uh, well, not only is it shocking that, that these workers who only worked for an hour received a whole day's pay, but it was also shocking that he brought forth the 11th hour workers first. I mean, wouldn't it made more sense if he's wanting to keep the peace? How could he have done it different? Well, he, he could have brought them in, uh, you know, first in, first out. And so he could say, okay, the first ones, we agreed to a denarius today. That's right. Here's your denarius. And they're happy and they leave. And then he waits for them to get off the property. They're no longer in the vineyard and say, okay. I didn't want to tell them until after they left. I'm going to pay you guys that came in at noon. Are you happy with the Daenerys? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Three o'clock? Yeah. Okay. And then they wait. And then the 11th hour workers, okay, coast is clear. I'm 
going to give you a denarius too. Everyone leaves that's happy. But in this story, he, he changes it. Why? Because he wanted the workers to get the message. He wanted to share what this is all about. The master wanted those that worked all day to observe the grace that he extends to others. And so in Matthew 20, verses 10 and through 12, it says, So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner like Colton. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Essentially what they're saying is, where is the justice? You told us going in that this is, you're a just landowner. This is not fair. This is not fair how you're doing this. And so the people cry foul. But usually when people cry foul over compensation, it's being underpaid. But this time they're, they're crying foul over a landowner that's overpaying. And that, that's important for us to understand. The ones who resent it the most are the ones that felt like as Colton did, and by the way, he's been a great sport on this, those that have earned more because they've worked harder. Who were those that, that were hired first? Who, who were the chosen ones? They're the ones that are fit. They're the ones that are healthy. They're ones that, that are skilled. These are the ones who, who are, are definitely, you would go and say, I want you, and I want you, and I want you. So they have a certain pride about who they are as a worker. On the other end of the spectrum, who are the 11th hour folks? That's the guy that kind of walks with a limp. Maybe it's someone that's unskilled. He, he's green. He, he's young. Uh, maybe someone who, who's weak and, and can't carry the big heavy basket. It's, but now they're all on a level playing field. In, in the eyes of the landowner, each one is valued the same. And so the ones that are fit and are chosen first say, it's not right. Matthew 20 and verse 13 says this, but he answered one of them, friend. And any time you read friend in here, uh, just realize the same word was also used for Judas as he came and, and brought the soldiers into the garden. So friend is not necessarily friend. I am not being unfair to you. Didn't you agree to work for me for a Daenerys? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same I gave as you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So what the landowner is saying here is, I am indeed just, and you can't say otherwise. We had an agreement, and I came to terms. I have met those terms, and as I paid you, that money is yours. Take it and leave. But what's remaining, what I have in my satchel, in my purse, that's my money. And I can choose to distribute that out as I see fit. It's not my fault that you resent my generosity. In other words, the agreement has been kept. See how this comes full circle? So now we must focus in on the wage. Why is he doing this? And what is Jesus trying to communicate by this? Well, let's think of it this way. If God is the landowner, which I believe he is, and God's also the, the, the father of, of the prodigal son. What can we learn about the landowner? What can we learn about our heavenly father from this story? Number one is our heavenly father cares for those in need. He cares for those in need. He could have sent his foreman to go in and to hire the workers. Instead, he goes five times. He leaves his precious vineyard to come. Five times he goes back to the marketplace. Five times he scours it and looks for those in need. That's our Heavenly Father. Five times he does this. He's searching for those that are needy. They're unemployed. And as the day wears on, those that are hopeless, he's trying to provide hope. And he shows not just compassion, not just, well, my, my heart goes out for you, but he also shows him generosity. He says, I'm going to pay a whole day's wage even though you haven't earned complete day's wage such is the heart of our heavenly father the second thing is and th this is the lesson for me you know there, there are a lot of lessons 
that uh, people will, will come up after services and go, well, that one was just for me. And I just go, no, it, actually, it was for you. I was thinking about you. But, but th- th- this one's actually for me. His care is not merit-based. Length of service and long hours of labor in the heat of the day hold no claim on God's generosity. You know, all merit just kind of shrivels when we think about the, the true heart of our Heavenly Father and His self-giving love. That's the point of this. It's not how hard they worked in the vineyard, but the heart of our Heavenly Father. You know, it, it sounds pretty good. I, I mean, that we've got this Father that cares, and we've got this Father that's not looking at, at necessarily our efforts, but our, it's showing His unconditional love. Who wouldn't love this story? Well, at the time of the telling with Jesus, the Pharisees weren't wild about this. They just weren't. After all, they, they were pretty pleased with their diligent service and, and how that they had spent time in the Word and the law and had crafted this, this whole framework of how they were to live it out. And they had spent so much time, they wanted to dispense that knowledge to others. But because they were living above the fray, they had a certain contemptuousness for those who were the commoners, those who couldn't quite get it, those that didn't have higher knowledge. And so this whole deal about the Lord lowering the bar so that all can come in, that's not the message that they wanted. Certainly, Matthew is writing to the Jews. This is many years later. And, and certainly they might have resented this story as well. This whole idea that for 2,000 years they've been called God's holy people, His chosen people. They've been the ones that have been handed the law. We'll protect it. We're going to live by this. Well, we're going to try anyway. So for 2,000 years they've held this special place. And now this message is going out. There's people that have been invited onto the vineyard that we don't want to be working with side by side, namely the Gentiles. And so there would be some resentment there. I think also, you might think that the disciples, they might not have wanted to heard, uh, heard this story. Because if you back up further in, in Matthew chapter 19, right after the story of, of the rich young man, you have Peter that, that comes forward and he's like, you know, Lord, uh, We've given up everything for you. We, we've given up our, our homes and our families, and we dropped our nets. Remember to be fishers of men? Yeah, that, that's us. Uh, and now you've got this whole influx of people coming in after Pentecost, after they understand the whole story. Well, you know what? Us disciples, we were Jesus. Jesus wasn't cool. So you just remember that. And this whole idea of letting uh, just any and everyone in, we need to be held in higher regard. Don't like the whole idea of dropping these requirements. Finally, the other ones are you and me. What about those of us that have worked longer? Those that grew up in the church, those that have played by the rules, those that when others went out to do X, Y, and Z, we were taught not to, so we took a step back and it cost us socially. Do we really want those that chose to do X, Y, and Z, those that came in at the 11th hour, those that have lived their life of sin, now to come in and, and us not to get anything for this whole life being dedicated to the Lord? That's hard. What about those that have worked harder? We have some servaholics around here. You can raise your hand if you'd like to, but... You know, well, actually, they're not in here. They're, they're serving in the nursery and, and down here with puppets and doing all this on, on Sunday. And, you know, on, on Mondays, they, they go and check in on, on shut-ins. And on uh, Tuesday, they bake brownies for the ladies' Bible study. And Wednesdays, they, they, well, they'll call Amy, what class do you need? Fourth grade. Okay, I'm in. Okay, Thursday, well, that's the day that we do Meals on Wheels. We get the idea. So it's hard to imagine our church not functioning with that 20% that does 80%, but it's hard for those that are in the 20% to think that that's not going to pay off someday. That the, the whole idea that, that God's not going to recognize us, that God's not going to have a, a, a mansion that, that's closer to His, because we, we hear about the people that say, well, just by the grace of God, I'm going to sneak in. Well, that's not us. 
We know we're getting in, and we want to be recognized above and beyond. But this story tells us it's not that way. It's also for those that have been more righteous. We've been taught, don't drink, don't smoke, don't chew, and don't date girls that do. You know, and especially the chewing part. That's just, mm. And, and for those of us that have thrived in a black and white world where there's right and there's wrong, it frustrates us when we see non-believers and we see Christian brothers and sisters that live according to various shades of gray, kind of go and, you know, kind of go back and forth. It, it bothers us. It frustrates us. When we see people that live according to these standards. Wisconsin, Wisconsin minister Roy Ratcliffe received a phone call called from the prison that an inmate wanted to be baptized. When he showed up there, he didn't have a name, didn't have a number, didn't have anything. He just showed up and the warden says, we, we've got someone that, that wants to talk to you about his faith and wants to be baptized. Well, the prisoner in question was Jeffrey Dahmer, a man known worldwide for his 17 crimes of murder and dismemberment and cannibalism. Well, after performing the baptism, Roy talked about how that he spent an hour each week coming and, and really d discipling Jeffrey, or Jeff as he called him. So an hour a week, they, they sat down and talked about what it meant to be a believer of Jesus Christ. Now that you've given your heart over to him. And so they spent time in, in God's word. Five months later, Jeffrey was beaten to death by a fellow inmate. In a book chronicling the experience, Roy writes this. One of the most common questions put to me about Jeff has to do with the sincerity of his faith. And I usually hear this from Christians. They ask if Jeff was truly sincere in his desire for baptism in his Christian life. My answer is always the same. Yes, I'm convinced that he was sincere. But this question bothers me. Why question the sincerity of another person's faith? Baptism represents a change in lifestyle. The questioner always seems to hope I'd answer, no, I, I don't think he was all that sincere. They seem to be looking for a way to reject Jeffrey as a brother in Christ instead of seeking him as a sinner or seeing him as a sinner who's come to God. Jeff was judged not by his faith, but by his crimes. Folks, this is works makes righteousness. It is. We want to be, I so appreciate what John talked about in his prayer today, about God is much more interested in our tomorrows than what happened yesterday. He doesn't want to define us by our worst day or days or period of our life. He wants to define us by his son, Jesus Christ. That's how things change. And we've got to get that within us. Grace, amazing grace, is the message of this parable. That is crucial. And Matthew says you're not going to understand the, the kingdom of God until we really embrace this. It is, as long as we're pursuing righteousness of our own, it's going to be fruitless. We can't do it. We're like the Pharisees. We, we've got to let that part of us go. And, and even mature Christians need to wrestle with this. There's no rankings within the kingdom of God. No one can claim deserved membership in the kingdom. We simply have a Father that loves us and loves us dearly and wants a relationship and to give us life. Several years ago, Minnie Pearson, an old black woman who worked in the housekeeping department of a hospital in Memphis, each and every day she rode the bus back and forth to work. And as she was leaving the, the hospital uh, and she was walking down Union Avenue, she was heading to the bus stop. She saw this stretch limousine that had parked up and it was almost on top of the curb. And so what was interesting is all the doors were open on this, but no one was around. And so she looks both ways, and she's like, I've never seen the inside of a limousine. So she kind of pulls the door back a little bit. She puts a hand down and takes a look inside the limo, which she's checking it all out. This is a custom one. It's a stretch. And she's just amazed at what she sees. And she says, oh, my goodness, what a beautiful car. And then she realized that she's halfway in the limousine, so she lifts her hand back and she gets out. And as she comes back, she realizes there's someone behind her, a large man. 
And so before she can kind of gather her senses, the gentleman behind her says, that one's mine, but I'll buy you one. And with that, Elvis Presley invited her to come into the limousine and had his driver drive them to the showroom. And when they got in there, he said, pick one out. So she chose a gold and white 1975 El Dorado. Folks, we, we have to start seeing our salvation this way. We, we do. It's a gift from God. You know, we have nothing, and we've done nothing to deserve what God has given us. You know, we've not worked for it. Meanie's caddy came through meeting the king. Our salvation comes because of relationship and knowing the king of kings. That's what this story is about. And that's the God that we worship. A couple takeaways. Praise the Lord that we worship a God who keeps going back to the market. For some of you that feel like you've been passed over spiritually, that you haven't been, been ready, or you, you just feel like I'm not worthy, you've got a master that came back five times. And it may be the fifth time, but the Lord is saying, it's time. I'm calling you. I want you to be a part of my kingdom and be here in my vineyard. You know what? We also have to have that same heart. That's basically Jesus' ministry, going to the highways and byways. It has to be our ministry as well. We have to keep going back to, to the marketplace and saying, we want you to come be a part of this kingdom instead of kind of pre-registering folks and, well, if you'll clean this up. But no, 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 come. Be a part of the kingdom. Bring them to the Lord. And finally, work, serve, and live out of response to your salvation. Not try to earn it, but because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, that's why we serve. That's why we work. And that's why we give all to the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this time. Lord, thank you for this wonderful parable. Lord, sometimes it's uncomfortable for us. But Lord, I, I, I pray that we realize that we are just as sinful as Jeffrey Dahmer. That there is nothing that we can do that can bring us to you. Lord, help us to realize that. And unless we embrace our sinfulness, and as Paul said, we've all fallen short of your glory. And Lord, help us to realize that because if, if, if we don't realize how sinful we are, we can't relish in what you've done with your son Jesus on the cross on our behalf. And Lord, help us to realize it's a gift, a gift like that Cadillac that we don't deserve but because of your son Jesus, a gift that you've freely given to us because you love us unconditionally. Lord, help us to live in response to that. In Jesus' name, amen.